The last topic we'll discuss for polyatomic molecules is Huckel theory. So as I've said previously, if we really want to understand polyatomic molecules, we often have to you know, use computational chemistry to really understand what's going on. Uh, but back before computational chemistry was really available, uh, before computers were invented, um, there were some uh, molecular orbital treatments that give us a lot of insight about what's happening in particular types of molecules. And Huckel theory is uh, one, one example of this that applies to conjugated organic systems and still gives a lot of insight into what's going on in terms of the energies and wave functions of uh, these conjugated organic molecules. And so this, in Huckel theory, make a lot of simplifying approximations, uh, as you might expect, uh, but it still leads to something that, that's very similar to what you would get with even a more advanced theoretical approach. Okay, uh, so let's look at this for these conjugated organic molecules, and this is specifically looking at the pi electrons in these conjugated systems. We'll basically ignore the sigma electrons and assume that they're there, but that they don't affect the calculation very much. So this uh, was proposed all the way back in the... 1930s. Um, so, you, so obviously before we had the access to electronic computers uh, and things like that. So let's uh, start with uh, some, our simplest possible system uh, that's a, got a conjugated, I mean it's not really conjugated, but has a pi system. Uh, in general this is looking at uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, so we'll look at ethylene, uh, C2H4. Uh, so what is, if we think about this in terms of hybrid orbitals, what does this look like? So each of these carbons will be sp2 hybridized, right? This is a limit, this is a planar molecule. Um, and so if there's sp2 hybridization, sorry, planar molecule, the sp2 hybrid orbitals are going to be forming the sigma sigma bond framework, and that leaves behind one p orbital that's not part of this hybridization scheme, if we consider it that way. So if we, if I take our molecule and kind of draw it uh, on its side, right, something like this, we'll have our p orbitals that point up and down are not part of the hybrid scheme. And this forms our pi electron system. And this is the, these are the electrons we're looking at in Huckel theory. So we're looking at just the pi electrons, just these p orbitals that are not part of the sigma bond framework, that are not part of the hybridization, uh, and we we treat these independent of the of the sigma bonds. Okay, and so the question is, how will these p orbitals interact? Right. So we'll have positive and negative lobes, uh, and we'll do what we've done in so many other instances we'll take our atomic orbitals and form linear combinations, right? So we can form linear combinations of these atomic p orbitals. And this forms our trial function that we can use in a variational theory approach. All right, so our wave function for our pi orbitals are going to be some coefficient times, we'll call these the z orbitals, the two pz orbitals on carbon A, and then some coefficient times the 2pz orbital on carbon B. And we should get, you know, positive and negative versions of this. Uh, and if we treat this by variational theory, as you know, use this as our trial function, uh, we've seen this where we have a linear combination of two functions um, and we can write our secular determinant, right? Well, this is a problem that we've already looked at specifically. Uh, right, and so just to refresh you on what the secular determinant looks like, we have H11 minus E S11, H12 minus E S12, and right, these uh, these H's and uh, S's represent uh, integrals, right? So H involves the integral with the Hamiltonian operator in the middle of it, basically an expectation value. Uh, using function one and function one or function one and function two, and the S is without the Hamiltonian. So H22 minus E S22. And this determinant equal to zero. This allows us to solve for E and also allows us to determine the C coefficients, the C1 and C2. Okay, so from here, we need to make some simplifying approximations uh, to, to make this uh, a tractable problem. Uh, so the assumptions that 
Huckel made were that for our S integrals, what are known as the overlap integrals, um, we assume no we assume no overlap. Basically, these S integrals are zero for orbitals on different carbon atoms. So essentially what this is saying is that for S11, sorry, not that it'll equal one. Actually, no, yeah, that is the assumption we make. S11 equals one, we'll assume the wave functions we're gonna use are normalized. Uh, S22 will equal one and S12 will equal zero. And basically any overlap integral that involves something that's not the two, same two numbers, our numbers here representing our different carbon atoms is gonna be equal to zero. Okay, and then we have our Hamiltonian matrix elements, our H11, H22, right? So for the Hij matrix elements, what are the assumptions that we make? So Huckel said if I equals J, basically if you have the same carbon atom that you're dealing with, so H11 or H22 in our specific example here, uh, we'll assume that they're the same for all carbon atoms uh, and that they're essentially equal to the energy of a 2p orbital in carbon. Uh, so same for all carbon atoms, approximately equal to the energy of a 2p orbital. on carbon, right, specifically. Uh, and we give this energy the symbol alpha. We'll call this alpha. All right, and then we have a couple other parts to this. So we need to know about what if i and j are not the same. If i and j are from neighbors, right, so carbon atoms that are right next to each other, um, then all the Hij that are from neighbors will be equal. And it's equal to a constant that we'll call beta, which is approximately equal to negative 75 kilojoules per mole. And this is from you know experimental observations. And then if I and J are not neighbors, then Hij equals zero, right? If they're far enough away, we assume there's no overlap and that this, this integral will just go to zero. So if we wanna rewrite the secular determinant using these assumptions for uh, ethylene, uh, we'll have alpha minus E, our cross terms will be beta, and another alpha minus E equals zero. And in the next video, we'll look at solving this determinant.